Whoa, so there are some things you guys want to see, and one of those things definitely isn't 10 words of wisdom. I'm just kidding, different videos float different people's boats. So anyway, Evolvio wasn't producing results, so it's dead. We're back to the old evolution simulator because it's at least proven that it works. This episode is all about threes because there are three major changes I've made. <sighs> what are those three changes? Well, I'm pretty sure you're gonna find one of them out really soon. Hold on just a second. Oh my god, 3D, what the heck, it's 3D, it's no longer flat anymore. Crazy, right? Whoa. So yeah, it's pretty clear, I just added the Z dimension to the simulator. So the world's worst tragedy happened because I recorded this entire video just to find out that open broadcasting software was just dropping frames like crazy and in the final recording it was like two frames per second at times. So even though the audio was perfectly fine, um, you still couldn't really see what was going on. And I was like, I guess I just have to re-record it. And along the way, I've gone through like three or four reruns of Evolution Simulation down to like 3,000 generations, like really long runs that I had to do overnight. But each one kept resulting in either um, results that I really didn't want, like crazy twitching, or like open broadcasting software would cause problems and I have to try to fix them, uh, processing would crash or something, so then I have to redo it again. Um, <laughs> enough complaining, okay? The point is, this is my second or third time recording this video, so I just want you to understand the struggle I'm going through. So yeah, 3D. This is pretty crazy, right? So what's different and what's the same? Well, the general fitness measure is pretty much the same. Creatures are just measured on how quickly they can run away from the origin, which is this blue square right- oh, right in the middle, you saw it. Um, but this time, because it's three-dimensional, there's two dimensions of running, so it just calculates the, you know, x comma z distance from the origin as the fitness. So to all the people who commented on my older videos, saying that I shouldn't consider creatures that run to the left as really really slow since I'm throwing out half of the potential fast runners, well this time I fixed it, because all creatures that run fast are considered to run fast. Except there are none now, because, you know, it's the first generation. Whoa, this is like the first creature that actually stands upright, I think. That's pretty crazy. I'm also interested in 3D- oh, there's another one. 3D Evolution Simulator because I can add a lot more nuanced goals that creatures can try to achieve, such, such as steering the direction of their running to, say, avoid obstacles or run away from predators. They can also search for food, or maybe they can do tug of war. I really want to try them do tug of war against each other because that will actually be the first competitive event that they'll do. I guess you could do that in 2D, but 3D makes it so much better. Essentially, every single idea I've had so far can be combined with 3D, so it, it was a logical next step for me. Anyway, you might be thinking, this episode is all about threes, so what are the two other big changes I've made? Well, for the astute viewers out there, you may have already noticed the second one. It's this neural network in the upper left. So it's exactly like the one in Evolvio, you know, um, you got your inputs, you got your hidden layer, and you got your output layer. How does it all work? Well, okay, first of all, um, I forced all creatures to have four nodes and six muscles in this tetrahedral structure, because otherwise I kept getting triangles over and over again that would spaz like crazy. Because when you spaz, you will go in some direction, I don't know what direction, really far. So spazzing, you know, it worked. But I didn't like it. So this way it forces creatures to be a little bit more stable and have a little bit more intent. Anyway, since there are always four nodes and six muscles, there's ten inputs here. The four ones highlighted in white are the nodes' Y coordinates, so how high they are off the ground. And the six black labeled nodes are the muscle lengths. So a value of one means that that muscle is exactly at its um, desired length. You know, each muscle tries to reach its desired length. So if it's 0.7, that means it's only 70% of its desired length. And if it's 1.5, that means it's be currently being stretched to 1.5 times its length. This is based on what it records, not what it does. It's an input into the brain, after all. To explain the next step, I'm going to finish this generation and show you the next generation. Okay? I think you'll be okay with that. So clicking finish just makes the computer run through all 1,000 creatures as fast as possible so it can instantly skip to this inventory of all of them. So pretty cool, you can see like little pop-up windows. 
Oh, and you can also control the camera just the same in this pop-up window, which is extremely convenient. So we're gonna sort it. I removed the sorting animation because it was really slow, um, especially with now that, now that it's 3D. So the fastest creature was this one, which is like, that's not very fast, but you can see that without any real brain or sophisticated brain, just flopping to one side is a very good strategy to get further away from the origin. More specifically, 0.13 meters away from the origin. Okay, so I said I was going to the second ger generation to explain the brains a bit better. So we killed 500 of the slowest creatures with a bit of randomness. Then the ones that survived get to reproduce. We're gonna go back. So, in the second generation, you can see that the, the brains of each child have mutated a little bit. So if you look at the brain, there's a few extra accents between neurons that you didn't see before. So, if an accent is white, that means a positive, is like a positive multiplier. This 0.7 is being multiplied by some positive number and going into this node here. Um, so, for the hidden layer in the middle, it's summing up all the weighted um, like values through the accents of all the nodes in the input layer. Putting that through a sigmoid function so that it's between 0 and 1, and that is that node's output value. So now the, the middle layer knows what to output, and the same process happens for the output layer at the very end. And now the output layer, um, the top four output layer nodes tell the nodes nothing, kind of. It just, they're useless. But the bottom six, those are associated with the same muscles again, and it tells the muscles how much you should expand or contract. So if it's a number less than one, it'll contract, you know, based on how extreme that number is, and it'll expand if it's above one. Now the thing is, if I let muscles go down to a length of 0.1 and then back up to 1, that muscle got to expand 10 times, and that is overpowered, it is so OP. So to be more realistic, I made it so that muscles can only contract down to 80% of their natural size and expand up to 120% of their natural size, which I think is more realistic like a human muscle, right? So that's how the whole brain works. And that alone should be enough to create simple enough walking cycles, right? Because using these neurons, you can pretty much say, like, hey, if my back node is really high, that means you need to take a step forward by contracting this muscle. That's really all you need. And you may have noticed that compared to my old brain system, which had the yellow accents and all the math functions, this is a lot simpler. And I was like, it should be simpler. Because one, the creatures weren't using all the advanced functions I was giving them, like modulus or sine or cosine. They were pretty much just using PY and then um, using that to like, tell how far it was through the walk cycle. So I'm like, don't give them more than they need, so that's what all they get. They just get Y coordinates and muscle lengths. Um, and then the second reason that I switched from the axon system to this neural network system is that with a neural network, everything is a continuous value. So the weights of the axons, the value of the neurons, they're all just numbers, real numbers, that are continuous. They can easily go cr across a gradient from like 0 to 1, there's no steps. That's a lot better because creatures can gradually transition from one type of movement to another by slowly adjusting the values. With the old yellow axon system, that was a lot harder to do. You'd have to do it all at once with very sudden mutations. And yeah, that's not good because it's like you're either all in it or you lose. So that's not good. This is better. So anyway, I'm going to click finish for this generation because there's not much else to say. So you may have realized I just mentioned two of the three big changes I've made to the simulator. Now I'm, I'm sure you're on the edge of your seat wondering what the third one is because you're just so curious. Well, it's actually not that exciting. Okay, so I gotta back up a bit and tell you the whole story. In Evolvio, which is now dead, I noticed that the seasons, you know, from summer to winter, it seemed like they were helping because during the summer, not many creatures were dying since there was enough food for everyone. So places would tend to overpopulate and because there's a ton more babies than there should be, there's a lot more muta mutations, a lot more experimentation, and yeah, creatures could just pretty much try whatever they wanted. And then during the winter season, that's when creatures were dying off and natural selection was only selecting the best ones. But since there were a lot more mutations from the summer season that had just passed, there were more mutations to choose from, and perhaps um, evolution could come up with more creative solutions because, you know, there's more mutations happening. 
so I thought seasons were helpful, right? Because because you need that like create a bunch now kill a bunch, create a bunch now kill a bunch cycle. I wanted to implement that into this simulator, but the problem is it's kind of hard coded so that every generation has 1,000 creatures. So is there a way I could kind of emulate the same process while keeping every generation with a thousand creatures? I think I do know how it could be done. Because the thing is, every surviving creature gets to double its genes essentially per generation because it gets to reproduce. So here's what I'm going to do. I have this thing called survivor bias at the top. What it means is at 100%, creatures at the very top of the um, leaderboard, the one that are moving the fastest, have almost a 100% chance of survival, and then as you go down to the bottom, the slowest creatures have a 0% chance of survival. Now, as this goes down to, to 0%, then it becomes more and more of a level playing field, and even the fastest creatures have a 50% chance of death, and the ones at the bottom also have a 50% chance of death. And when everyone has a 50% chance of death, that means that on average, each creature will just have like a population of one next generation because it either goes down to zero or goes up to two because it reproduces. Um, so that's kind of the same thing as overpopulating in summer, just in the sense that there's no real tendency towards stronger creatures for that time, and defective creatures can flourish for a little bit. But then when the, the survivor bias rises again, then evolution will take its course once again. So it's like seasonal. I have it looping every 50 generations, but after doing like three or four runs with it, I just discovered that all that was happening was the line graphs were just like doing sine waves and it would go up really far and then it would fall back down. It would go up far and fall back down. And the general trend was slowly upwards. But I was starting to realize this survivor bias thing wasn't really helping. It was just making this evolution simulator a lot less efficient. So um, I kind of just capped it at 100% again because that's always produced the best results for me. So, that kind of means that the third big change to this simulator isn't a change at all. I'm sorry, there's really only two changes. Anyway, I know a lot of you get bored by just me talking, so why don't we just see what the median creature looks like after generations and generations of evolution? 